So, just, just to start with the problem space that Nix uh, is trying to solve, um, there is a, when we, we, when we package things in a Linux distribution or, or in any packaging system really, um, there is this uh, loop of state where a package uh, outputs, which are files, land on the file system and then the next package picks up those files among new packaging metadata and, and uses that to, to build uh, you know, another package and, and this loop goes on and on and on and at the end it, it's hard to see really what was compiled or built with what um, and it's uh, even, even worse, it's, it's not reproducible, right? So we have kind of uh, two spectra, you know, two things that are trying to solve this problem. On one spectrum is the containerization, so start from scratch and, you know, go through, through, the, feed, through the state loop so many times and always end up at the same thing. Or we, we use Nix where we try to, to be precise and use uh, purely functional language um, to, to, to be able to, um, to compose things together, which you know, should in theory give us uh, a bit more precision and power to, 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 our, um, to our pipeline. So yeah, Nix language, it's, you know, I think it's almost 15 years old. Um, it's a DSL, so you will see that some areas because of that are like uh, debugging are not uh, a good story yet. Um, it's purely functional, it's dynamically typed, it's, it has lazy evaluation. So I assume most of you are, are Haskell developers here. So um, I will, uh, that's assumed during this talk. Um, and yeah, this is how you basically, you would, you know, get started. Um, you install it through this uh, terrible download through the internet thing that you know people tell us all the time it's a terrible idea. But uh, how do you bootstrap a package manager if not through internet? You're encouraged to use the GPG keys and so on. Um, and then the current version doesn't come with REPL, but you can install it, and you know you can get started. So let's let's go into a language a bit. I think it's good to to build that um, baseline to to some examples. Um, we, we have, uh, you know, it, it does the right thing when it comes to dynamic languages. If, if you, you know, do try to use operators that don't make sense, it will like uh, error out. Uh, you, you can query for uh, what type, uh, what type of uh, do you have? And also you can assert types and say um, that we have a string. Um, as I've said, it's a DSL for packaging, so it has a kind of special properties. One of them is it has a single quote. Well, first of all, it has double quoted strings. that are, you know, the plain, the thing you would expect. Uh, and then it has like this single, double single quoted strings, which basically what they do is they strip out all the, the indentation. Um, you will see here that basically it, 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 th it takes the most left part of the string and strips everything out. Um, and all, including the, the, the prefix, um, it keeps the suffix, uh, new lines, for example. Um, and this is nice so that when you build make expression and you nest them in your editor, you don't have to like always um, strip that because in configs, uh, you don't want this indentation, right? So this is kind of the, the motivation behind it. So it, it, it removes the black, uh, black space? Sorry? It removes black, it Just black space. Actually, no, 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 not, not black, but white space. Uh, just in just the indentation, not not nothing else. Oh, okay. So it preserves everything else. Um, so in, in Nix, we we have this something called preoms. These are the, the functions that come with Nix. Uh, you can see the whole list if you just type built-ins. Um, and you know we have something we call attribute set um, up there. And for example, there is a function called attribute names, and you can get then all the the keys in there. Um, and again, if you pass it like a boolean, it will like say that you know you're you're not doing the right thing with the right type. Um, functions. That's kind of the, the core of it, right? Um, we have lambda functions. That's the notation at the top. Um, it, it has the same kind of application as Haskell, and there is, you know, there are the, the bad parts of Nix is uh, 
this, um, where if, if you don't put a white space there, it will consider this as a URL. Um, yeah, Th there are some bad. I, I didn't include all of them, but there is there is some dark corners, um, and this is really bad because well, we don't have types, so suddenly, you know, something instead of getting a, a function gets a string, and you know, debugging becomes a bit of hell. Um, so, um, these are kind of the things uh, I would like to, to that Nix would clean up after you know through time, but we'll see. Um, and then it doesn't have well, the pattern matching is basically you can have these attributes as uh, as a you know, as an, a function input, um, uh, like uh, this is a function that accepts a and b, and then you know, um, it uses the plus operator, and here we pass a and b, and we get four on. This is like the core of Nix, where you pass packages and attribute sets in, and then you do something with them. You wouldn't use integers usually. You, you, the the main type is all attribute sets all the way in, in Nix. Everything else is like a secondary. Um, and then there's also defaults in attribute in attribute uh, sets um, when they're you know as a, a pattern match for for the for the function. So you can say that if you don't pass a, it's true. And then if you pass an attribute at empty an attribute set, you, you get a false back. But if you pass it in, then uh, you get you know the logical thing out. Um, this is also kind of useful to to set defaults when when there's you know something not set. We'll see that later on. Um, there's this. Um, you can get all, all of the all of the inputs in in the arcs, um, and there is one caveat there: the defaults are not included. So if if you have a default like this, and you don't pass a explicitly in, the the arcs will be will not include it. That's that's oh, another trick that another tricky thing that um, yeah hunts hunts you. Um, and then there's some, you know, syntactic sugars around it. Uh, like, if you, if we, you know, we have the let in, okay, that's pretty obvious. If we have an attribute set like upstream, we can create another attribute set by, you know, using the, the dot uh, something uh, more fr from from the guys using PureScript or, or Elm, um, and and the the you know the shorter version is to use inherit, which basically means take the upstream attribute set and then you know inherit a and b fr from it um, any questions so far All right pretty basic um and then there is this uh, recursive uh, function that basically you can have an attribute set that that references uh other other values within itself instead of doing this let in at the top, um, yeah, it's pretty basic. So and there is this with which basically means declares the namespace. So if you have an attribute set and you say with this attribute set, then you don't have to always uh, prefix uh, the attribute sets, and you can just go. We we usually use this for a big package set, so you don't have to say packages dot blah blah blah. Um, one one thing that's really tricky with with statements, if you have with x and with you know epsilon, the the first one prevails after the second one, so it doesn't override, uh, which is really unintuitive. Um, and you have lists, um, yeah, they're without commas, so anything you do in here, you have to put in parentheses, otherwise you will you know you won't get. If you have a function and you want to you know. Uh, call it inside uh, the list uh, as an expression. You have to put it in parentheses, otherwise you'll get weird results. Uh, as I've said, it's a lang lazy language. We have this imports uh, statement that basically means it, it doesn't have modules at all. You basically import everything that uh, a, a, a file returns or a function returns in a file. So if we have uh, a a file and and b a nix and b nix, you can cross cross import um, and if you use instantiate command you can evaluate it and, and so, so the type of the output of that import is the type of what it was outputted in the yeah. other file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So the yeah. And then you can say you know, then you can use the attributes after you get the the return values. This is kind of like the, the core of, of how packages work, uh through Nix. Nix file, I have like a huge attribute set 
yeah yeah that's uh, usually yeah you, you get usually what you do you have a, a top level function in the file which is like an attribute set where you pattern match the attribute set and you know you you kind of get the the inputs and then you return an attribute set of, of packages and things you want to to get out It it would it wouldn't fully evaluate uh, well in, in this case B and in this case A right. Uh, so it would just say like function or something. It would just say code. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tunk whatever yeah. Um, and we have paths. Uh, one of the another one quirk is if you want to refer to a, a current path, you have to do dot slash dot, which is again something. Uh, if you if somebody doesn't tell you, you say dot, and then it's 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 like an attribute set access, I think, and then you know weird errors happen. Uh, again, Nix was never meant to to be successful, and you can see that um, in some places. Um, and yeah, we differentiate between strings and and paths. And um, I have I have a, a, a blog post in, in progress that kind of explains. It's pretty actually complex how how Nix handles the difference. So I won't go into that now. Sorry. <laughs> maybe maybe we can. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe I publish that blog post and, and you can read it and tell me if, if that makes sense. And then it has kind of three ways to do exceptions. One is well, just to forget the try evil for now. Uh, if you say a board, that's like you know a board's evaluation, and there is no way to 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 go around that. There is the throw. Uh, which you can actually then catch with try evil, and it says you know uh, either success is true or false, and then either you get the value or you don't get the value. Um, and this is what we do in X packages to evaluate each package, because if one fails, we don't want the whole thing to fail. Um, and then we just print out the error and we go on. And then there there's also the assert, so assert expression and another expression that follows, and you can also catch that with the try evil. Um, yeah, this is another gray area, uh, dark area where it's kind of tricky um, a lot of times to, to, to be precise of, of what errors you want to catch and what, you, what errors you don't want to catch. There's not enough precision. Um, and then there's, there's built-ins like read file. And you know, if you have a file foo and it has contents bar, you actually get that back. So the question is, where's the purity, right? Uh, that it's, it's not. Um, we don't have types, so we, we, where is the you know where do we declare purity? Uh, so Nix has a bit different model than Haskell. Um, so yeah, let's let's look at that. So for now, we have this basic language. It has you know attribute set, lists, blah blah blah, but it, it's very pure. We, we cannot interact with the world, right? It's pretty boring. Um, now now this is where 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 the where, where the gist of it comes in, the derivations. Um, and the derivations they produce build products, um, and you know, from so from Nick expression to a derivation, this process is called evaluation time. So we take Nick's you know files and you create, you evaluate them, you get a derivation files, and then if you realize derivations, you get build products. So it's a, a two-step thing, and the reason why that that's the case is you might want. To to evaluate Nix, get the derivation files, copy it to you know distribute it over machines, and then you want to realize them. Um, so it, it has that's why the, the it's a two step thing. So the derivations are basically uh, intermediate representation of Nix expressions, fully evaluated. Um, so oh, let's say we have a very simple C program, which basically only does it gets an environment variable out, and then you know it creates the file. Uh, we compile it, and this would be our most simple derivation up there. Uh, it, it requires three fields: the name, what system is it going to to, to build on, and what's the builder. The builder is a, an executable that creates the, the the output path. That's the that's the minimum thing it has to do. Um, and and down here we see this process. So uh, this is evaluation. Which you know goes from Nix expression into the derivation file, and you see this long hash, uh, and then Nix store minus R realizes that and builds it into and calls the builder to produce the output path. Um, so, for those that use Nix, Nix build is basically, you know, those two th two steps combined essentially, um, as a convenience. 
um, if you're on, on this, if you're building and then realizing on the same host that you use Nix build. Um, so, so then comes the question of where is this hash coming from? This hash is a, a hash of all the inputs for, for the derivation, right? So it's basically content addressed. Um, and, 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 and this is where the purity comes in. Derivation is built in a sandbox, like separated from the file system, disabled networking, everything. And, and all the things that are allowed to influence that, bu that builder are coming from the derivation attributes. Um, this is the purity part. Okay, I've got completely lost. What okay. does instantiate do and what does store do? So inst instantiate takes an X file, evalu evaluates it into a derivation. L and a, well, derivation is basically this internal representation of, of what Nix is going to do. Um, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's hard to show it here. I'll, I'll, show, I'll show it later. Um, and, and then Nix store minus R is it takes this intermediate representation and actually goes and executes uh, the builders, so realization part. So why doesn't it just execute the builders immediately? Why is it broken into two things? Yeah, so you you would want you would want to, for example, let's say you have a, um, you know a lot of Nix expressions, you want to 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 evaluate them and then distribute the builds, right? So you wouldn't be able to distribute the, the building part if it would be just one one thing, or at least it would be harder to do so. Right. Um, yeah, or if you wanted to change, if you wanted to construct a derivation on one machine and build it on a different type of architecture. Right. Because derivations basically for a dependency tree, so you can write write an algorithm that takes the leaves and, and you know like distributes them. So it's what's the concrete form? What's, what's the sort of a concrete form of a derivation? It's, it's fully evaluated. Yes. But what is it a fully evaluated thing? What is it? Is it? Um. Yeah. It's. A, Good question. So Gabriel Gonzalez wrote this really cool tool. Um, uh, let's see. Part part of this talk is. He wrote a Haskell parser for it, but it's basically, uh, it's kind of inst instructions, right? Um, so you, you've reduced the whole problem to a set of known yeah. steps yeah, you that, the build, that the builder's going to execute. Yes. yes. So it's like all the outputs it's going to create, all the inputs it needs, what the, the, the builder is going to call to actually build things in the sandbox, what, you know, what is the environment, what are the arguments to the builder, and so on. So everything Nix really needs to build this thing in, in the sandbox. So you've effectively constructed a, a code base that you execute with the builder. Yes. Yeah, a sort of, a sort of um, you know. And this is this is you know a hash. A ha that's, this is the hashes are actually hashes of all these inputs, and this this is the purity part. And when you say of all of the inputs, do you mean it's also it's the source of the derivation of the of the Nix expressions? And, and, and the hashes of the things they reference? Yes, yes. It, it's kind of like implicit because all the inputs you get already include the hashes in the string, so... Okay. It's, right, so, yeah. so if, I, if I reference this builder file, yeah. it'll get put in here with a hash, which is the hash yeah. of its content, yeah, and, 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 and therefore... Yes, okay. yes. And then it basically knows that you know you have different hashes and it, it goes... So it forms a dependency graph. So the, the way it constructs a dependency graph is basically it scans for hashes through the derivation files. And, and the same at runtime. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a bit. Does that answer your question? You seem in to part. be in yeah. part. OK. Well, maybe, maybe as we go on, it becomes clearer, or we can go back and, and revisit this. Um, so yeah, this is not the best way, um, but <laughs> sorry. Um, and then, OK, and then, then comes this you know, very common problem in packaging, the bootstrapping, right? Now, OK. In, in, in this case, we, we took the, the compiled you know, file as our builder, and that was our, our input, which was you know, pure, as we always get the same uh, builder. Otherwise, the hash would change if, if the contents of the touch file would change. But now we, we want, for example, to compile it from source, right? And then you get into this bootstrapping problem of like, where do you get G, G8, you know, GCC from, right? So 
um, you have to start somewhere in Bootstrap. Um, and this is where Nix packages come from. Uh, you have we have something like standard environment, which is like the the baseline. So we 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 take binaries of GCC and so on and bootstrap the the basic derivation with the binaries. We compile that again to 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 from source, and then you get standard environment, which includes the the bash builder um, and GCC and coroutils and all, all of the the standard tools and and the make the make f uh, file is there and, and so on. So quite quite a lot of things that you get out of out of the box. Um, so and and then this is more like something you would really use uh, from Nix packages. Um, okay, and here it becomes tricky. This is like the the typical uh, pattern or however you want to call it, where we import Nix packages and then we 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 put it into our namespace so we don't have to say packages that stand in environment blah blah blah. And this this is the part. This is the the function that that calls the primitive derivation, um, and and you know Nix itself doesn't come with any packages, so it's very you know it's meant to be a general purpose thing. But to do anything useful, you need to have this uh, environment uh, to build things in. Um, this is this is um, yeah. We would need a bit of time to go through through all of this. I'm sorry for being a bit vague on this one. Um, and and then the the make derivation kind of is, is accept these more high level attributes like you, you can tell it where the source is and you can tell it build phases. And the way this works is actually it's a long bash file that basically execute bash functions and it, these build phases are basically bash functions that are then like uh, inlined into this whole builder bash process. Of course nobody stops you, you could basically use Haskell uh, as a builder and you could like pass it in and, and all of these attributes are passed in as an argument to the builder, basically, on the command line. Uh, so nothing stops you from, from creating a Haskell builder if, if you want to go so far. Um, there is actually a, 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 a GUIX, which is kind of like, a, I wouldn't say competitor, but a, a, a friendly uh, uh, experiment, uh, which, which uses Guile uh, to, to go all the way down. So it uses Guile as a, as a you know, the the language for, for describing the, the derivations, but also the builder is, is written in Gal, so you have the same language all the way down. Um, so um, that's, uh, yeah, we, we're, we're here, here Nix goes the pragmatic approach and, and Gal, and, and GUIX goes a bit more extreme. Um, and yeah, and here with the make derivation, you already get GCC and so on, so you would, you would be able to, to use that. Changing the touch C in this case make a new derivation or uh, yes. So every time you would you would change the, the touch C, basically this source here would you know this the con the content of this source would change, so the whole the hash would change because of that basically. Okay, so, it's, so at least the checksum of the, the directory that it's using. It that yeah, in that yeah. So all all the inputs, right? In this case, source is is the whole. If you had a different file in there that wasn't even referenced. In your build process, yes. change that file. Yes. It rebuilds. Yeah. Okay. So, like for local development, if if you have local things, uh, like you know, like uh, an editor, an, an, an editor config, or, or so on, you have to filter that out. Otherwise, it becomes part of the hash. I hope. I hope that's. Uh, it's it's a lot to cover, so I, I cannot. You know, we, we would need a couple of days to really go through all the details and there is the uh, uh, there there is these are con you know content address derivations but there is also a fixed output derivation which basically means instead of calculating the hash we give uh, the hash to the derivation and then you can allow network access because anything you get can be hashed at the end right um, so this is how you, you this is how you do networking then um, and, and again, we, we, we have a determinism by, by this hash that we provide. And the fetch URL would use you know, curl in, in the background in the derivation, download it, and then the assert the whole, the whole output has this, this hash. That's, kind so of that's how you get copy of, um, I don't know, the Haskell. Yeah, that's, that's our, you know, that's our IO basically. It's based on the fact that you, you, you assert the. So your, your IO is basically populated <laughs> by my workspace. Yes. By going and pulling this from the what, and then by the way, the checksum of what you get is this. I yes. So, so what what this allows us to do really this this hash 
hashing is that I think for the very first time we have a, a, a packaging system that is source and binary, right? These hashes uniquely identify how our packages were built. So we can basically ask, ask a, a service, oh, with this hash, can you give me the binary package? If not, I'll build it from source. So Nix is, is transparently, uh, it's, it's source and binary at the same time, right? And we, we, we use this binary, we call this binary substitution, which you can use SSH or HTTP or, or something like that to ask for the hash, or you build it from source. And, and this is what we do in IHK as well. We have the binary cache. So actually you can get you know, a, a 30 megabyte compiled uh, Haskell uh, binary for most of our commits that, that are um, uh, in, in the GitHub. And, and I think one of the, one of the you know, major you know, um, things that Nix really you know, invented or discovered, uh, to be precise, is that we, we have this path allocation, like memory management, you know, when we went to high level languages and you can say, give me some memory and all this stuff. This is what Nix does with paths, right? You say, you know, give me a path with, with foo.txt name and, and with the contents bar and, you know, you have it. Um, and then you, you can nest that and it builds the dependency tree. Uh, so this is how it, you know, collects what belongs together. And, and so there are two garbage collectors. One is on, on the, the language itself, you know, if, if things go, you know, uh, with things are not references, it, it, it garbage collects them. But there is the, the second garbage collector uh, that actually, as we, as we allocate these paths, right, there needs to be some way of, of saying, how do you clean them up? Because it's, it's, it's immutable, it just creates them, and then nothing really, you know, uh, deletes them. And there's the, the garbage collection uh, part, which I, I don't really talk much about. Uh, in this workshop, but essentially what you do is, is, you, is you define a strategy. How do you want to collect things? You can say like, I want to have 10 gigabytes of, of my disk free and I, everything else is, is you know, um, um, should, should stay there. And, and it, it has this concept of GC roots of where you define, um, you know, you link uh, the, the build Nix, Nix expression into a GC root. And that means it won't garbage collected, and it's um, it's it's better to, to read that up. It's it's pretty. It's not that important really. Uh, we have terabyte disks, so whatever. Um, yeah. Then then there's this concept of entering this environment in which the builder will be build the, the derivation, and this is where where Nick Shell comes in. This is the the development tool, right? So. If I say, uh, if I if I have a a, a default .nix file, which is like the convention of what it will use, and if I say, uh, you know, enter the hello attribute, and this is a derivation in that file, then instead of you know, actually taking the the inputs and and ex you know building the 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 derivation in the builder, it will just take the inputs and enter a shell with all of those inputs present. Um, and because our, if, if our builder is bash, of course, if you would take Haskell, then you would have to implement kind of your own shell. I guess this, then it would use, you know, the, the, the GHCI uh, as, as, a, as a shell. But um, in this case, you, you get into a bash environment, all of the inputs that would, would be used to build the hello package. And by default, that inherits your environment, so it's convenient for people if they have editors and so on that you know they're still around. But you can say pure, and then you know if you if if whatever is not declared as an input to do the hello derivation will not be there. So you know. Um, now we're going to to a part where where things become very blurry. Um, for most of the people, it's like how do you then use this you know functional language. Uh, as a as a way to to override our packages, like that's what we kind of wanted, right? If we want to have this precision, then we better use it. And let's see let's see if we can cover this quickly. Mm. So a very typical package uh, would would be something like, um, as I've said, uh, an input up there that you pattern match on all of the packages you will you will need to to build it. And then you would use the standard make derivation and then use those packages as you go. Um, 
across the different stages. Um, and the point is, now you can override these inputs or these packages that you're getting in. Um, but first, we need to build a framework for that. So the, the first naive thing you would, you know, one would do is um, you would have uh, an attribute set of packages, you would import them, and then like fill in all of the inputs. And, and these inputs would actually come from this you know, top level attribute set. So it, it would like fit them in. Um, so for example, input one would be here, uh, another, another package, and input two would be another package, and so on. So of course, you cannot have cycles, right? Um, but that, that's how, it, how, it, how the top level Nix packages, basically, if you open that file, you will see a long list of packages like this. Now the problem, the problem here is that every time you have to, you have to like, every time if you rename input one, for example, you would have to rename all the packages that get it in and so on. So it's a bit cumbersome to do that. Um, so what, what Nix offers is this uh, um, built-in called function args where you can give it uh, a function that has a, uh, an attribute, you know, that pattern matches on the attribute set. And it will tell it, you know, what inputs does this function have. So um, it will say, oh, it has an x, which which uh, doesn't have a default. This boolean means if it has a default or not, and it has an epsilon that has a default, right? So uh, you know, it's it's a bit more than just that. But what call package, something you see in x package uses very often, does is essentially that it it extracts all the inputs for this package. And it just you know f figures out oh I have to fill in the x input and the, the y input uh, into here, so you don't have to be as explicit about it. So you can pass an empty attribute set. But if you want to be explicit and uh, override an attribute set, you can just pass it in, and everything else will be you know kind of like uh, reflected from the function arguments. But this this one explicitly will be overwritten. Is that? Is that too magical, or, or, because the, the, to define call package, it's it's a bit of work, um, but hopefully you get the idea of, of how. I will give at the, at the end an, a reference to Nix spills, which is kind of like the the long version of what we're going through. Um, Why does it return f uh, false or and true? This is this basically means does the in does the x input have a, a default value or not? So this is the uh, this is uh -huh. the default. So yeah. if if you say a question mark something, then if you don't pass in you know epsilon, this will be the its value, and and this is so that you know, yeah. Some sometimes it's it, it's useful, uh, but in in the in the call <coughs> package, I don't think that's really. Used. It's more just what inputs does it have to f to, to fill it. Any other questions? All right. And then then what what call package does is it adds on on the derivation. It adds a couple of attributes. Uh, one is the the override function that you can basically now take this derivation and override it input. So as you see up here, right, these are these are the inputs that we, we kind of used um, for 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 that derivation. And and you can override them. So you can basically what you can do is you can take, I don't know, GHC and you say override, use different version of libgmp and you have two GHCs now, one built with, with one version of, of, of the library and one with the other. Um, and you can basically Use this overriding mechanism to, to be to, to build you know different 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 sets. So one of the things I did in the past is basically um, we, we wanted to test uh, we wanted to batch benchmark um, software and we basically did a huge matrix of different kernels of QEMU versions and so on and basically used that to benchmark the the software um, but basically by just overriding. Um, which is something you, you cannot really do in Docker or um, tools like that. And, and this one actually overrides the at this, these attributes here, here that's passed to the make derivation. It doesn't suck. So yeah, the, these attributes here, here 
that it's passed to make derivation. So you can either override the function up here or the attributes had passed, which which can also you know be avail you know there there can be let in 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 between and it can do you know some concatenation or something. So uh, it can it can have different values. Um, so, so this is like the the, the high level of writing. Ah, and then there is this this blog post, uh, a gift by Russell O'Connor in 2014, where where he goes to explore how do you do dynamic binding in Nix, right? So the the problem is if if you have an attribute set like this and you use the rec function, then you know x here will will come from 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 this definition. Um, but if you if you use if you merge attribute set, which is something that you know you take an attribute set and another one and you merge them together, then 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 this rec function won't have an effect anymore. It's it's only it's local to this attribute set up here. So you will see that the x here will will have this overridden form def, but the the, the rec part uh, that was evaluated here actually evaluated this x in in the original attribute set, right? So then. Why is, why is this really important? Because we, we want to have a package set and we want to add new things to it, but we don't want, um, we don't want the, any reference values in the original ones to, to keep the old, the old values, right? We want the whole thing to, to actually to, to be um, precisely overwritten. So what we do is we define the, the fixed point or the Y combinator, like right here, and I, I won't go into you know, how that most of you probably already know. If you don't, then um, yeah, there's there's enough materials out there. So what what it basically does this this uh, uh, fixed function then gets basically the return value as an input, and then you can basically instead of using the rec, you do self.x, and then what you can do is you can stack these uh, attribute sets together, um, and and you get them as an input. Uh, I'll, I'll show this a bit later how it works, but you know, um, this is kind of like the the baseline. This is the this is one of the parts that you know it's it's kind of hard to grasp. Um, but but the fixed point is kind of the the build the build the the our helper here, and there is a bit of uh, other things that uh, that he does in the blog post, um, trying to build a framework for. For for this uh, of overriding of package sets, which we'll see very soon. Um, yeah, I, I I haven't bothered to go through the whole thing. Um, it's it's pretty long actually, but you, you'll you'll see how how it's used then. Uh, if you if you if you know that it's a fixed point, I think that's enough to 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 understand how it works. Okay, so so this is the overriding part. Uh, how do we override uh, packages and how do we use then you know the Lix language to to, to really to, to get the to solve basically the dependency hell, the multiversion hell, um, and, and be precise about it. Question mm -hmm. uh, so in that second part if you were to do slash slash x equals D E F like you have at the top, would it do x equals D E F the next two equals D E F one, two, three? Yeah, so so there is there is one part missing here which will which I'll show a few slides later on uh, how, how that really then is used to merge the attribute sets. Um, OK, um, now I, I want to now move into more how, how Haskell ecosystem uses Nix. Um, first of all, there's the stack to Nix integration, stack with Nix integration that most of you use if you use Cardano. Um, and basically, what it does, if if you say in, in stack.yaml file, enable, and you know here are the packages. Then what it does is is behind the scenes, it, it calls stack. You know, if you call stack install, it basically executes, you know, Nix shell. It basically constructs this this uh, command line, uh, and then it calls stack again. So that's it. It repasses the, the arguments. So it, it's basically the same thing as you would you would. Say Nick shell and, and these two packages, and then you would call stack. It's just declarative in the stack file, right? Um, and you can go a step further to say, okay, don't like list the packages, but actually use a, a, a Nix file, and then it's the same thing as say Nick shell, and then you know executing stack within that. And the purpose is, of course, to provide the system libraries 
uh, to stack. The problem with, with, with this approach is that um, stack, stack knows precisely what Haskell packages it wants to build, but it has no idea about the global system state. So every time you, you change basically Nick shell, anything in it, it will like recompile everything from scratch. Because it's like, oh, I have no idea how this affects right uh, my all of the builds. So the best thing to do is to start from scratch. And and that's yeah really unfortunate when you have a uh, Cardano which has like a 360 dependencies if you want to build the full thing. So yeah, let's let's get into a bit of the infrastructure of Haskell and Nix. Um, there is this Cabal to Nix uh, tool that basically parse this Cabal file and translate it in, into how Nix would build that, that Cabal file. Uh, so it, it takes uh, Haskell infrastructure divide, defines another der make derivation, which is like one step, you know, uh, it, it wraps the make derivation for the standard environment and it defines like Haskell specific attributes that you can then tweak. Um, like, uh, uh, is 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 this uh, should we build the library? Should we build an executable? What are the dependencies of the library? Test executable and so on. And this is all extracted from the from the Kabal file. And and all all of the values used here are also um, in the closure of this function here, so that we can override it, right? So that we have this power from the before that we can override this up here, this function up here, and that you know. Uh, reflects then in in the make the, the 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 derivation build for Alex in this example, um, and then you know what we do we go through the whole package and and call basically Cabal to Nix on 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 all the packages, and you get this huge attribute set right. Um, in in the past before stackage came we we kind of like Petty used to you know try try and build things together now we just default to the latest stackage and then. We, the rest of the packages, we take the latest version. So we basically curate uh, the packages that are not in stackage because we, we want to have the, the full latest set. We used to have the full history, but that was like, you know, it would be a couple of megabytes right now. Um, so it's doable, but you know, if somebody would want to do like a community project, it's doable to build all of this. I think we, we calculated if you want to build like with profiling and without the profiling and the whole, ha it would be like uh, 20 or, or, or 15 terabytes of all together to, to have the whole hackage in all the common ways to use it. So it's, it's you know, it's not unreasonable, but nobody has done it yet. Um, all right, and then, okay, so we, we have this, you know, very high level Haskell attributes that we understand as a builder, how, how you know, how that reflect, how that affects the building. Um, and then what we do, we define these combinators basically that, you know, take the derivation and then override it. And may, for example, check means run to run the tests. So we have a do check and don't check combinators. That means you can take a, so what it means is you call Cabal to Nix to generate, you know, the, what it gets from Cabal, but then you, you, you can say, okay, enable the tests or, or disable the tests, right? So if, for example, if you have, uh, MTL package, you can say don't check and you get a, a new package back that won't run the tests. And then you can use these combinators basically to, to compose and, and, and tweak all of these attributes here, more or less. Okay, um, any questions so far? Sorry? We're being very quiet. All right, yeah. I don't know if you, maybe, maybe it's too vague or maybe understand everything now. It's, uh, Okay. Mm. And then, okay, and this is um, this is where our our previous uh, fixed point comes in, um, where where basically what we do is if we start down here, this 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 is an a this is uh, a package attribute set of all the packages. And then we extend this with Nix specific configuration and with common configuration. So the difference is this adds the system libraries, this overrides some of the versions uh, that you know depend on what the versions are in the package. And then we have a compiler specific config, package set config, I have no idea what it is, and, and the overrides, this is like your overrides that you want to apply. So what, what this does, it uses a fixed point 
and then it uses, you know, it basically, it, it's kind of like lenses. You, you, you take the original packet set, you apply a bunch of overrides, and, and you go on and on and on. Um, and, and the way it works is you have two, two inputs, one is self and, and super. So super, super is, for example, in Nix configuration, super is Haskell packages, and self is Nix configuration itself. So it gets the, its own return value as an input. Um, so you can either, for example, if you overwrite something, you can say like take the the, the the package from super, or you can take the the package from from our own attribute set that we changed. Uh, yeah, that's um, this this file is a bit simplified, but that's basically what the infrastructure in, in Haskell does. Um, and and then you know it's all stacked together. Any questions about this? Yeah, it's, it's not like you know. Um, I would sort of have thought initially that was like a, a lambda, which was the beginning of another lambda. Yeah, it, it's basically two lambda, so you can you, you know do currying and, and you know the yeah. It's it's two lambda, so it it passes passes that in. I mean, this make extend extensible and extends is kind of like the what uses the fixed point then to pass in <laughs> the previous set and then the the set itself of, through a fixed point. Um, any other questions? And then, you know, this is then at the end how you would use all of this, what we covered so far, is you, you say, oh, I want the Haskell packages with compiler 8.0.2. So for every, we, we take the package and then we pass the compiler in and we create a new package set. So for each compiler, we do that. Uh, and you can get this package set by basically saying packages dot and compiler including, you know, GHC, JS or whatever. And then you override this set and you, you say overrides and then now you have the access to the, to the whole thing. And you can say, for example, um, okay, in my, in my attribute set that I'm interested in, I want to build stack, but in that dependency graph, I want to take the MTL, but don't build, you know, don't build, execute the tests, for example, and so on. Uh, and then, and, and here comes all the precision where, where you know, we, we override uh, our, our, our package set. I see some, fa uh, fa some faces are confused, some faces are like, so <laughs> I, I guess it co correlates with experience of Nix. Uh, we would have to do like a, a three day workshop really to go. Mm. But you know, it, yeah, it takes a time. The, the major problem with Nix is it, it does so much and it covers so many things that it's really hard. Um, and it does it all with attribute sets. And it does it all with attribute sets, yes. Yeah. And and, and, uh, and uh, the, the functions that operate on the attribute sets are, you know, not as precise as you would, you know, you have them in Haskell, for example, right? So there's, there's legacy. Um, okay, so now I want to cover a bit how we use Nix in IHK, just on a very high level. Um, one of the first things that when you, you start using Nix is it, 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 it uses this you know, less and, and, and more signs, which basically means the take take this Nix packages from the search path, which means this uh, Nix path uh, and bash environment variable. And this is, you know, this is a pattern that goes through the language packaging. I don't know who invented it, but it goes on and on. And it's, it's this, again, this global thing of the environment that, you know, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. Um, and like in Nix, we, we have this, uh, channels that basically then provide Nix packages and you update any, them and, and you know, it's all a bit stateful. So I, I recommend usually not to use that at all. Uh, what we do in IHK, um, and actually this was, this was a, a joint effort by a couple of people to come up with this um, idea, um, is, is we, we have this Nix packages minus source.json, which, you know, pins down Nix packages to a very commit. And then you, you import this file that's present in all repositories that basically uh, uses a derivation to, to import the, the Nix packages and then you import that and you, then you have the Nix packages to be used um, fr from there on. So there is no this global thing, but actually what is used is part of the Git repository itself, pinned down to the commit. Um, yeah, the, the how it's implemented, it's it's I, I won't cover it, you can like look it up, but um, 
it's it's definitely it's, it has improved our, our you know results a lot in, in terms of determinism compared to this because like when you have a CI you have to be careful that Nixpad has the same packages as you locally and so on and so on and so on so it's kind of cumbersome um, then the second thing we did we wrote this tool cool tool called Stectonix so what it does uh, it, it basically uses uh, inside inside infrastructure of stack to to build the whole packet set that stack would basically build you know either it comes from hackett or it comes from a local folder or it comes from git and then it calls cabal to nix on all of those and be, builds our own packet set basically and and why do why do we want that Be we want the developers to use the same packet set as it did use in production so we at least have some you know guarantee that this was tested and used right we don't want that the deployments just use a completely different set and 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 then we start finding out bugs and this is the the pack the f in the famous packet generator part that uh, you have to use to and this is a bridge so we want developers to use stack but deployments to use nix um and and this is our bridge between the development and the deployment world um it was recently uh, rewritten, and it's you know quite fast now. It supports macOS. It doesn't have this cabal revision, uh, non-determinism that you were, a lot of you were, were hitting, and so on. Um, uh, one one of the one of the things we want to improve is to to be able to override the compiler. Right now, it's hard coded f to 8.0.2, but you know, getting there. Um, and then yeah, then Cardano itself provides a, a package set again which is directly translates from what stack uses and you can say nix build cardano sl and you would get you know the cardano sl package and so on um this is is the, the, you, will, you would run this inside uh, the cardano sl git repository um, and for example we wrote the connect scripts so now you can actually uh build a full node and and this would basically build a best script that would run the node and you just run you know, for example, if you want to connect to mainnet, you, you say the first line, if you want to connect to staging, the second line, and, and so on and so on. And there's also, we have this top level attribute there where you can like, you know, override, for example, uh, you know, a, a topology file, for example, for people who want to use a different topology file and so on. Um, so we, we're now able to build uh, different kind of best scripts. And, and the next step is gonna be testing them, right? We'll take a, a virtual machine, We'll, we'll run run it uh, we'll run all of those inside and make sure that they all work right um, and you know you can also use docker we also have a, a docker function um, and you can use basic basically it uses the connect scripts in the docker it just you know provisions the cardano inside and then use those connect scripts and you know this is what 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 some of the our partners use um, to, to build a docker image um, and then, and then the one of the questions was, if I remember correctly, what what we I would, we would like to cover is how do you you know develop package in X instead of using stack? There is this attribute on each package called environment, and this is what you can like enter into. Um, so, for example, if you want to develop on the wallet, you can say Nick shell, and you would get you know basically all the packages that are passed to building the wallet. Um, and if if you if you if you're gonna modify anything that's not in the wallet but is as a dependency of the wallet, then you will have to re-enter the Nick shell because that's a dependency and you will have to rebuild it. But if you just work on the wallet, then you know. And and what's nice about this, you can switch back and forth between branches. Like Stack would recompile the whole thing. Here, once you once you you've built the dependencies once, then you're on your machine, so you can just go back and forth and and um, yeah. Yeah, future work. Um, what what we see in what I see in in DHK, What are we going to focus on? One is Nix 1.12 is probably coming out soon. That's been going on for the last year, so very soon. Um, it has a lot of really really nice uh, bug fixes and and features. I, I won't go into that. Um, there is a, a talk by Elko Dostra at NixConf this year that covers what's coming. So better just watch his talk. Um, and for deployments, we use currently NixOps, which is kind of like uh, NixOS, but with provisioning of, of the cloud services. 
the the alternative is Terraform. Uh, Terraform is is way be better when it comes to provisioning because the community is huge and they have a lot of things you can provision. So um, there there are now different companies exploring how could we like bridge those two. So we would use like NixOS for the operating system, but Terraform for provisioning part. And you know and then there is this different ways to do it, DAL, JSON at Nix, and, and the HCL, which is the Terraform language. Um, at the end, it's all JSON, so um, yeah, you pick your precision. Um, one of the things is the multiple outputs uh, GHC, which is like a patch that has been like uh, ongoing uh, together with, uh, with guys from Twig. We have been trying to get it in, but it's kind of hard. Um, I think I think it needs a couple of days more work. Uh, so what what does it do is um, we, we we talked about before where you create this out you know uh, out uh, folder which is yes. this whole Nix hash thing. You can create multiple of those called lib bin blah blah blah. And so when you when you when you generate a runtime dependency tree, you can like leave things out right. For example, if you, you, you can compile the, the executable statically and then you don't pull in all of the Haskell libraries. So instead of downloading, you know, one gigabyte, including the GHC, you download just uh, the 30 megabytes of the static executable, which doesn't reference that. And, you know, there is a separate output for documentation and, and so on. So you can be more precise of what are the runtime dependencies. So, for example, right now we have this minus static packages so they don't pull in, and, and this would be kind of like now out of the box. All the binaries you would reference to, they don't have this huge thing you have to like download. Uh, so it's mostly about reducing the, the what you have to download. Yeah, which is really nice when you like build a Docker image and hand it to someone. It's nice that it's like 50 megabytes instead of like a gigabyte and so on. Um, there is the cross compilation. We, you know, we, we ideally we would have Nix for you know all the platforms. So going from Linux to Windows, compiling with Nix. Uh, there is a lot of work in in the GHC right now to go to ARM, and you know how do we deal with template Haskell and so on. Um, one of the things that is also interesting is is the CI. There is the the Hydra. What we use is is completely pure. So it's like you know it gets inputs to the Nix, it distributes the that and builds and gets the, the build results back. But in CI, there's always this impure part where you know we have to do some extra stuff, interacting with the world. Uh, so there is there is um, a lack of a good tool right now. We use a build kite right now, but um, it, it's far from perfect. And then there is the NixOS tests which is basically uh, kind of a, a driver, how do you operate with a VM? So you can say, uh, okay, use this Nixo, NixOS config, build a, a VM, and then wait for this service to listen on this port, wait for uh, this service to start, um, you know, block this port, see what happens, and so on. Um, so this is like really nice for reproducible tests, and I think in RHK, we, we, we actually, Michael already wrote an initial version where we, we basically launched four nodes and they started the blockchain and, and you could then, uh, you know, make some transactions and, 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 and exit and, and get an output of logs and, and like analyze that and, you know, graph, for example, you know, I don't know, how long did it take to create blocks over the 10 minutes, how many blocks were missed and so on. So this could be all then automated. Um, that it's that the, this is basically almost ready. The, the part that was not working is actually that it, it uses VMs. So on on Amazon, if you do nested virtualization, it's basically emulation, not virtualization, and it's really slow. So the blockchain can keep up, and it starts to to <laughs> to fall over. So we will have to use bare metal machines probably to 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 do this kind of things. So we have to provision that. Um, yeah, this is, these are some of the references. I would mainly recommend reading the Nix pills, uh, if we can just cover that. Um, so this goes into very much in details into, well, what, what I just described. Ah, there we go. 
Um, and there is, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, a long tutorial about the, the insides of, of the Nix pack packages. It's pretty long, and, but it, you know, at least then it explains you. But they are bite size. Sorry? But they are bite size. Pills, you can take them yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're, you know, it's a before you go to sleep uh, kind of thing. Yeah.